And unfortunately, my favorite co-host is not yet here with us. Uh, and this is how to deal. And we are here today with Kelly Mauricia. So Kelly, how do you deal when shit gets real? Or you could just tell well, our listeners a little bit about yourself. <laughs> let's, let's go with a little bit about myself. Um, <laughs> Because I think that's basically how I deal. So I am a nurse by background turn author. I like to say that I'm author now because I've published. Mm-hmm. Um, I have uh, two kids. Uh, I call them my sketchy teens. Uh, <laughs> my 14-year-old. I know, trust me, they are sketchy. So I have a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old. And I have my fur baby, who is, I, I think, my favorite of out of everybody. Well, of course. <laughs> she yeah. listens to me. <laughs> dog or cat? A dog. A yeah. Dog. She's a border collie lab. And so she's super sweet. And um, yeah, she is she is the one. Yeah, I don't, have a don't little tell my kids. I, 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 I love it. Uh, well, you know, when they become teens, they, they become sketchy. So, you know, of course the dog's exactly. better. And uh what is it? I have a Pitbull lab mix and he's adorable and his name is Flynn but if I tell my husband like oh did you feed the dog like I, I just say like you know did you feed the dog he's like I do not have a dog I have a boy and I fed the boy and I was like well that's gonna get real confusing when your actual son gets here but we're gonna leave <laughs> that alone <laughs> oh that's funny so, you know, it's so weird only being here by myself because Rietta is always, it's always so nice to have banter between three people, you know, it's so different being like the only host is very odd. Rietta, come back. Instead of baby, come back. I tried. <laughs> so, Rietta, where are you? <laughs> you know, I already called her like three times, so she's disappeared and we don't know why. And that's fine. Well, here's the thing. I, I just, it's just occurred to me. This is how you deal when shit gets real. You just go with it. You just do it. You just got to go do it. it. That's it. That's it. You got to roll. You know, and I, I've had guests who haven't honored our time, you know, who haven't showed up. So to me, it's very important because we're the ones interviewing you to be on time. So I'm like, ah, (laughs) because this is about the first time that this has ever happened and hopefully the last anyway you do that oh thank you so (laughs) let's start from kind of the beginning uh you've been a nurse for 20 years so share some of your experiences and your lessons with us and maybe even your transition from a nurse to a writer oh my god so yeah so nursing has been um an amazing I'm going to say an amazing journey. I like to say that um, as a nurse, you get to really be with people at the most vulnerable stages of their lives. And so it's, it's always very humbling and very, um, very powerful in those moments. And oh, so, yeah. you know, it, it's been a blessing and I'm, I'm, I like to say I'm an introverted extrovert, which means <laughs> that I'm not extremely outgoing, but I can be. And so, you know, as a nurse, you're typically, you're meeting so many different people. And I really like to honor um, who they are and that space and have those conversations. And sometimes it's really hard to do um, in, the, in the realm of healthcare because it's so busy. And so, you know, being able to, at those moments, take the time to sit and chat with people. And I think that's one of the reasons that I, I like to write stories, because I always say that, you know, every fictional lie comes from, a, from some truth, yeah. you know, and, and so, and it's those truths that are powerful, that connect, and that really spur sort of, you know, the joy and the hope and the fear and all of that good stuff. So, um, you know, I can't really go into too much about what I've learned from nursing because, you know, confidentiality and all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, it's really a humbling and or it really has been a humbling uh, experience and very rewarding, very rewarding career. I've been a nurse for over 20 years. I think I really started in 98. I have nursed in many different areas, you know, hospital, rural um had the opportunity to work up in the northwest territories that kind of thing and so I've had multiple experiences that way so out of all those different places you've been nursing which one was like the best experience 
you know what, I'm actually going to stay, say when I worked up north. So I um, worked between uh, the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. Um, I didn't think I worked in the Northwest, Northwest, Tor- yeah, Northwest Territories, hello, for probably about six to nine months. And then I did the Yukon for like maybe two. I really enjoyed that experience because it really taught me a lot about the Indigenous people of Canada, oh, um, that's which cool. is an amazing, I mean, the first people of our land, right? And I, I like to say that I'm a squatter on their land, but <laughs> just the culture and the differences and the lessons. And, you know, if you want to meet people who can tell stories, holy crap, they have such an amazing oh, yeah. story telling ability and that comes from their own knowledge and their own experiences. And so um, I think that was the best nursing experience that I ever had because I felt like a fish out of water, you know, mm-hmm. totally, you know, the up, upbringing that I had and just their connection with the land that taught me a lot. How did you end up up there anyhow? I'm trying to think how I was probably out of nursing school, maybe two or three years into my career and I had wanted to experience something different I had wanted to travel and I saw that opportunity applied for it and boom got it so they were really struggling to I guess to staff a lot of the the nursing clinics in the north with nurses so you know at that point in time there was a lot of opportunities yeah I I wasn't sure if it was like part of like you know those missions where you know you get Mm. people to volunteer you know because it was only for such a short amount of time I thought maybe it was like one of part of those like missions or what have you like doctors without borders type of deal I don't know what else right no you know know what I'm talking about though (laughs) (laughs) well it's, it's interesting because um when you do northern nursing at least here in Canada you can go for as long or as little as you want. And most people go oh. for short stints to try it. It yeah. is, again, because it's, it's cold. Like it's it's really ex- extreme, I'm sure. <laughs> it is. It's very, very, very. Like, I think the first, we landed in probably about September. And we were there probably at the beginning of September and two weeks after it snowed. And it wasn't just like, you know, here's a couple of flakes. It was like oh, intense yeah. snow. Here comes the ice road. You're done. Right? <laughs> and it was like minus 50 wow. and it was just it was cold. it was an experience take me it to the was. opposite direction I would like to go to like okay not Mexico I was gonna say Mexico but that's a little iffy I mean take me to like some sort of like beautiful island all right if I was gonna do that like don't take me to the cold take me <laughs> I'm going to go south. <laughs> well, you live in Hawaii, so I totally get that. But I think I did it too because, you know, as a nurse, you have that ability to travel anywhere. And mm-hmm. I wanted to travel someplace that I would never have gone. Yeah. Like, regardless, right? Oh. So that was 100% an experience, an experience mm-hmm. that I probably would never have had. So what happened to transition you from nursing to writing? Ooh, I think I've always been a writer at heart. I, like I said to you before, I love stories and I love, um, I love when people tell stories because I don't have that, or that vocal storytelling ability. Like some people can tell you a story and you feel like you've gone through that, right? And you're like, holy crap, did that happen? When did that happen? And that's not me, but I can weave, I'm a really good weaver of words. And I, when I write something, at least I think I am, (laughs) when I write something, I, it's that same sort of almost that vocal story that somebody's told that I can uh, mimic in a page. And I've always loved writing stories. I've always loved English. I've always, this is crazy, but I've always liked writing essays. But for this, this story, like these, this book and this compilation of stories, this happened when I was going through a really rough time in my life. Like just a, there was just a bunch of things with my son that was going on, stuff with work that was going on. And it was just a very intense period of time. You know, I had been blogging on and off, nothing really of substance. And um, I had a colleague that came into my office one day. And I remember somebody telling me something before this period, you know, write about what you know. And I was like, uh, what do I know? I, I know nursing. Nobody wants me to write about nursing. Like, I can't write about nursing. What does that look like? Anyway, so she came into my office one day and she's like, hey, Cal, take a look at my shoes. And I was like, whatever, you know, yeah, I love shoes, but I'm like, why am I looking at these shoes? And so I looked down at her shoes and I thought, okay, whatever, man, they're a pair of brown thing loafers. Not my thing, right? But then she lifted up her, her foot and on the bottom of this shoe was the word love. And in that moment, I was like, 
that's it. You know, here I am, I'm a nurse. We're always taught to look at things from the perspective of walking in somebody else's shoes. And boom, that's where all the stories started to flow from. That's awesome. And so then can you tell us about your book? So it's a compilation of, I call them micro fiction stories. They're, they're really short, I think. Probably about, I'm trying to think how many stories in there, maybe about 20, maybe 25. Um, and they span the gamut of emotions, right? People that are going through joyous events, people that have gone through like just gut wrenching. Um, you know, I think there's a lady in there that has cancer. There's another lady in there who can't, can't have children. And it's just like little snippets of emotions. And I really wanted, I think the purpose of me writing those stories in that book was to, to make people connect. I think sometimes we wander through life and we think that whatever we're going through is ours and ours alone. Whereas, you know, if I'm feeling this way, there's somebody else out there that feels this way as well. And I wanted to have that connection so that people knew that they weren't alone. And then, of course, I write from the the perspective of people's shoes only because A, I love shoes, but B, because, you know. (laughs) I, I truly love shoes. But, I do. Um, I love also, that. That's great. The perspective of somebody's shoes. I never would have thought of that. It's great. <laughs> but yeah, so, but it's, yeah, like, you know, it, it's the outward appearance that we see. Like, you know, you see somebody that's walking around in a thousand dollar pair of shoes and you think, oh my God, this person has a great life, but do they really? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't know what it took for them to get those pair of shoes and what they're going through. And that was the whole inception of these stories. That's awesome. And it's also really similar to why we started the podcast was to put people's stories out there so people know that they're not alone. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a big fallacy, especially now, like, especially over the last two and a half, three years with COVID, right? You know, when people have been isolated. I love the air quotes. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) We do that all the time in the hospital, like COVID, right? No, but like, you know, when people had to be socially distanced, when people couldn't see loved ones, right? Like when you were truly isolated, Alone. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? And so to, to be able to have that link to another human being, I think it's extremely important. It's extremely important, not only physically, but also for your mental health as well. I love that. And uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. guys, I swear to God, technology has it out for me since I've moved. I don't know if it's because we live in the woods or what it is, or because I have two computer systems set up, one for work and one for not. But anyway, we don't need to hear that whole thing. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kelly. My apologies Hi. for my tardiness. So glad you're here. It's all good. <laughs> and it's I'm all right. I caught that very far. <laughs> well, I'm glad I caught that little ending because that was wonderful. And I always, as a fellow writer, I love hearing why other people wrote a book and what inspired them. And I don't know if you said what inspired you, but if you didn't, I would love to hear what inspired you to write. (laughs) So going back to write these stories in particular, it had to do with a word that was um, on the bottom of a a pair of shoes that my colleague had. And it was the word love. Um, And it was the the most amazing thing. Like it's, it's odd to say that I had a connection to a pair of shoes in a moment because it sounds honestly superficial I have a, um, I have a uh, I have an attachment to all of my shoes so I, <laughs> 100%, 100%. So, I mean I see shoes online I'm like ooh, pretty so I completely understand and I don't care if it's shallow <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't actually about the shoe though because I know those shoes were ugly um, but it was more about the word on the bottom and it, it, it sparked that a what did the person who created those shoes, what was their intention? And then what was their story? And that's how I got started thinking about, oh, you know, what are the stories of people who wear shoes? And honestly, the minute I had that thought, I would go out on the street and I would see random pairs of shoes just lying there. Like, I think I saw a pair of shoes by a bus stop and I saw a pair of shoes in the window of like a convenience store. It was like the oddest things, like the stories just kept coming from there. Hmm. Actually, that reminds me of what's his name? Uh, Tom Hanks. But see, he doesn't do pairs of shoes. He does like random like left items like somebody lost a glove. Somebody lost like a sock. And he like posts it on Instagram. And my husband thinks it's creepy and that it's part of a conspiracy, which I'm not going to go into because I love Tom Hanks. (laughs) 
but it's like it reminds me of that that's all i'm getting at yeah well there's also something similar to on sex in the city for anybody that's a sex in the city fan and you guys know that i've referenced this so many times but we're gonna keep doing it um <laughs> carrie at one point dates a guy um that she calls burger and he picks up playing cards all over new york city that's like his thing he finds random playing cards all over new york and he hopes well he his hope was to one day have a complete deck good luck Uh, same premise same premise (laughs) similar ideas but just it's just funny it's the same thing that you were talking about though like you don't notice those things until you start to look for them that's crazy yeah yeah absolutely so something that you said in your pre-interview that really I think interested both of us was that you study the moon phases so tell us about that I'm a new studier of the moon phases, but what I've come to realize is, so it goes back to sort of nursing, really. Um, We have this thing that on the full moon, like just, it's just- Oh yeah. So like there's so much energy, right? And so as I've gotten older, I've kind of noticed how my own flow mimics the flow of the moon, right? So the moon goes from the new moon to the full moon. And then you have the waning and the waxing. And I've noticed that when I sort of set intentions for myself during a new moon, the planting of seeds, et cetera, and I start to sort of intentionalize that. So let's just say I want to, I don't know, the way that I'll put it is I'm working through this course. So I'll start like a new module on a new moon and then I'll kind of continuously work through it. And then sort of add on different modules or do a bunch of different uh, videos and sort of build on it till I get to the new moon and it's this celebration and yay I finished and it's sort of a big circle and I notice that with everything that goes around on around me with the energy around me with <laughs> my own sort of female stuff everything sort of ties into the lunar phase for me um, other people do it with you know the phases of the sun etc but for me the moon has really been that catalyst of um, manifestations and intentions and just really um, even just letting go and being being able to let go and flow. Um, I, I feel like it's such a, a potent presence in, in my own life. Interesting. I also did not know that people follow this phases of the sun. So the more you know. <laughs> it was just Uh, really funny that you had mentioned it because like at the same time my son started studying the moon phases in school so like every day he'd come home and he'd be like mom today is a waning I I don't know what the word is (laughs) there you go see I knew you'd know and I'm like cool all right buddy so like he knows all the phases and I'm like "Mm -hmm." (laughs) (laughs) well it's funny it must be with every he must be in grade I'm gonna say grade six no he's in fourth grade He's in fourth. Okay. Cause I remember my kids doing it at the same time and they had to do like little, little projects. Right. So my son did a, uh, my first son did a um, phases of the moon in oh my God, fluorescent paint, or fluorescent paint that glowed in the dark. That's awesome. cool. Like, I want that t-shirt. Yeah. And then my other son did Oreo cookies, right? Like the faces of the moon. Oreo that cookies. one sounds like my kind of project. Cause I would eat. <laughs> I'm not, like, I'd be like, great. I need to eat this much cookie. <laughs> perfect <laughs> well, you, even when you go back further right like when you think about people used to navigate to the moon right and mm-hmm. they would so there, it, it's such a heavy influence that I don't think that we realize how how in tune we really are to it that's my whole mystical side coming up <laughs> oh no, that makes sense <laughs> yeah. So speaking of the mystical, does your miss does this, your study of magic and the moon phases relate? Are they one in this like related, or is it a totally different, separate things for you? They can be. They can be. I actually tend to, um, well, everything actually flows into one another for me. So the phases of the moon, if you're thinking of magical terms, there's so many different manifestation things that you can do with the phases of the moon. Um, but yeah, no, my 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 magical sort of interest is purely from a, I think it's something that I've always been interested in as a child, like when I was younger, see a candle and you think, oh, can I blow that out? And again, it's just a weird thing that I would think never, ever happened, right? But the more, the older that I got, the more I wanted to learn more about magic and how magic influences um, sort of 
how we operationalize ourselves in on this earth. And it has a lot to do for me anyways, with harmony, right? Just being in harmony with, with nature, being in harmony with the energy around us and being in harmony with the people that we surround ourselves with as well. So do you characterize yourself and like the magic that you practice as like Wicca? Like what do you prescribe no. to? Does that <laughs> make any all. sense? Got it. It does. I wouldn't, I'm definitely not within. And I think my Christian people would be like, oh my God, shut up, Kelly, stop talking right now. <laughs> it's more <laughs> about it. nature stop and it. energy. It is. It's 100% about energy. And, you know, it's interesting because when I first delved into um, magic, we were I was doing a class on rituals. And really, when you look at all the different religions, there's some sort of ritualistic base to them, right? Like, oh, so yeah. I grew up, I grew up very Catholic and went to a Catholic high school, um, an all girls Catholic high school. And like just the rituals of lighting candles for the dead or going to like going to mass on every Sunday or going to confession on a Saturday, that's all ritualistic. And I think we sort of box ourselves into like what's right and what's wrong, right? Like when some people say, when you hear like, oh my God, she's this person practices Wicca, you automatically think pagan, devil worshiper, et cetera. And witchcraft has nothing to do with that whatsoever. Um, and I think, you know, I, I just like learning about the different, um, the different spiritual, spiritual teachings, because that's what it comes down to me is all the different spiritual teachings. And I, I wouldn't say that I'm one versus another, I kind of take the pieces that resonate with me and, and sort of live my life that way. So, yeah, I like relate that. to that. 10 out of 10 mm-hmm. was hoping that you were going to be like, no, I'm into illusionism. Here, let me make this disappear. <laughs> <laughs> I got a quarter out of your ear. <laughs> Sorry, because wouldn't that have been really funny? <laughs> it would have been. My kids would have been like, stop talking. <laughs> yeah. No, that makes it even better. It's like, how do I embarrass them further? <laughs> Let's get into illusion. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just a little kooky sometimes. And I have funny no, thoughts. <laughs> I totally that relate to what fun. you said, though. Like, just coming from Hawaii, I like to read all about, like, what they believed in. They're, they're very spiritual, and they have a lot of connections with different gods and goddesses. So it's fun. It is. It's fun to read about all that and understand it and connect with it in certain ways. And Buddhism is the same way. You find certain things in Buddhism that speak to you. I know that I like reading a lot about that too. So I, I get yeah. where you're, where you're vibing with. <laughs> yeah. Because even when, so my brother was in an accident and what Rietta sent was these two different lays intertwined and blessed with Hawaiian magic. And then she like wrote down like all the meanings and Rietta could get into the, what that means. Cause I kind of remember, but she always has it more like beautifully, like put. Just- oh, I still don't do it as well as the Hawaiians, but, um, you know, they, like a lot of people believe, um, they're very connected to the earth. So mm-hmm. a lot of things in the earth are very spiritual. Um, so like the, the nuts provide light and hope. And then like the lay, which is made out of, um, I think it's pronounced tea leaves. I hope I'm saying it right. That's the other thing. It's really hard to say the Hawaiian words, right. But it's the same thing. It brings a lot of light and healing. So they believe in lots of those things. And then when you combine them together, it, it just provided all that that he needed. And then the Hawaiians bless it. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's, I love that. That's lovely. You know, it makes sense because in Canada, well, our, our indigenous population is very um, in tune with nature and they live sort of, it's sort of that symbiotic relationship with the land, right? Where you know, us in Western culture, we're all about, let's take what we can and forget about everything else. And I think it's that when you live in that harmony, right, you learn that it, it, it's almost, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's a different kind of connection that you have with people um, and animals. And it's, it's very pure. Um, and if only we can all the global all sort of live in that same space I think that yeah. it would be a much better world to live in absolutely I agree mm-hmm. with you well and and they're like less connection to stuff because like we're very heavy around having mm-hmm. this having that etc so absolutely. they're more they're like way more like simple simpler mm-hmm. yeah well, and, and, you know, what I've also noticed is that it's the very gratitude laden 
here I'm still killing this animal to eat it, but I'm giving gratitude to the animal. Yes, like you're it, thanking like, you know, it and whatnot. Yeah. And exactly. then you're using every single part that you absolutely can. Exactly. You know, there's really, they don't really waste anything that an animal mm-hmm. would provide because then you're demeaning taking their life, basically. Mm-hmm. That's my yeah. understanding of it. Well, that's like even the Hawaiians, like when you get like a lay maid, you're supposed to unravel it. And obviously you don't want to put the, the string or anything back, but you're supposed to put the rest of it back in the water and give it back mm. to the island. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Mm. See? Very beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was one. I loved learning all that about Hawaii and all the things that they do. I mean, I still don't even, I'm sure I don't even know half of the wonderful things they do, but it's fun to learn what you can. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to backtrack like just a teeny bit. Um, And (laughs) hopefully Connie didn't already ask you this, but I like to, I have a very good friend who's a nurse and my sister-in-law is a nurse. So I always like to ask, what is one thing that has happened since you've been a nurse that like really struck you? I think my biggest experience, like my most earth shattering experience had been nursing for quite a while when this had happened. Actually, I had a Buddhist monk actually who was passing imminently we thought she's gonna go she's just gonna you know she's looking she's looking like she's gonna go within the next 24 hours and it amazed all of us that she hung on for like at least I think it was like 30 days after oh, wow yeah and, and it was interesting because and I've, I've never experienced a Buddhist sort of passing I mean I've obviously Western culture experienced that. And it was the most, mm, it was the most touching of all the experience I, experiences that I've ever had. There were so many people in that room and they were chanting and, oh. and it went on for days. The transition that that, 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 that lady made was phenomenal phenomenal like, and I've seen people at the end stages of life you know and it, it's not pretty you know there's no. a lot of stuff that happens right but this was probably the most peaceful and calming um, passing that I had ever seen and, and filled with such oh god filled with such appreciation and love because of all the people that had been surrounded that had surrounded her. very rarely do I see like a lot of family members or a lot of people in that space when people are passing um, and so that I think that moment really touched me I, I really felt like you know this is one person if, whose spirit is going to sort of transcend and it will be very peaceful when it happens um, because of that moment wow that sounds incredible yeah mm-hmm. It really was. But I mean, I think in nursing, there's a lot of moments like I was um, telling Connie, like, it is such a privilege and an honor to to be in that space with people at the most vulnerable um, points in their lives. When I say vulnerable, I don't necessarily mean that they've had like this horrible accident or they're passing like I mean, even women having having children, you're still in that space of vulnerability. And to be a stranger and, you know, to be in, almost invited in, like, I mean, they don't have to, I mean, yes, you're in the hospital and you have to have a nurse and you have to have a doctor, right? But it's still <laughs> that connection that you have that is amazingly powerful, very impactful. And I, I don't think that, you know, people who are nurses and who are, are in healthcare and who are embroiled in the busyness of it all really fully appreciate it. And I think it's because I like to tell stories, I kind of have that you know, that, that connection. And, and I've always treated every one of my um, patients as though they were one of my family members, right? And I kind of, that's how I went into nursing was thinking that this could be, you know, my mother, my father, my brother, whatever, right? And so mm-hmm. how do I yeah. impact them in that brief amount of time? Since we're back on nursing, how <laughs> has Canada dealt with, like, was your COVID, like, because you were, were you working as a nurse during COVID? Uh, I was um, in management at the time, but yes, so <laughs> I was there. Was it as insane as it was here? Like, what was your view on it? How did you take it? Well, I think I had a different lens um, mm-hmm. because I was in management and where I was working at the time. But I did have a lot of friends who were on the front lines and who mm-hmm. had to deal. Um, a really good friend of mine, actually, her, um, she was working on a. COVID ward, COVID nursing unit. 
And so she ended up getting COVID. <clears throat> and I remember her calling me saying COVID. And of course, I was like, oh, my God. Right? And this was very pretty much in the beginning. I think we shut down probably in about April. And I think in about June, she told me that she had COVID. And I was like, okay, no problem, whatever, right? And then she got really sick. Like I was texting her one day and she wasn't texting me back. And I was like, what the hell's happening? And then she finally got up the strength to text me to say, I'm in the hospital and I'm on oxygen. And my heart oh. just sank. It's like, oh my God. And so she recovered and then um, went, you know, went home and was off for a, a pretty good stretch of time. And her mother contracted COVID. And then just going through those emotions with her because she had COVID now thinking that she gave it to her mom, even though she tried to quarantine and isolate herself and all of that. And her mom eventually got really sick and passed away and sort of just watching that trajectory of it all. Um, oh. You know, so I, I get really, I get really frustrated when people say, well, you know, COVID is just like a common cold and Hey, I, I get where you're coming from. Like that's your perspective, but I also have this perspective from the nursing side. Right. And yeah, and, and, and a very intimate sort of, experience with with what she dealt with not only as a nurse but for herself and then being you know being a child of somebody who, who ended up um, passing because of it so yeah yeah it, it, it was it was pretty insane here depending on where you lived I know bigger cities definitely had their fair share of of COVID and ICU admissions and, and all of that. And, you know, my hat's off to the nurses that did work the front lines because it was a very trying time, right? You know, people yeah. like to say, well, you know, you got into nursing, you kind of expect No, that. Yeah, no, no. You, you get into nursing, you don't say expect a pandemic. No, and yeah. that's the difference, right? Come on. Like, I think that was, that was the real big shock was, it was, it, and, and I, I, I even say this, it was like my whole career as a nurse in two years right it yeah. was just go 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 constantly mm-hmm. right and you know issues with masks and you know issues with gloves and just all of it having to deal with it all the time constantly and you know in an eight-hour shift and you know policies and procedures and everything changing just yeah. rapid fire so Oh yeah. Yeah. We've talked to several different people and different types of firefighters, police officers, all the different things that they had to go through for because of COVID. And it's, it's crazy to hear it all. And I personally don't like that saying or whatever you want to say, like, you know what you signed up for? Cause they say it to me too, as a military spouse. And I'm like, mm. that's, that's not how this works. It's guys. Not a thing. <laughs> yeah. So that sentence needs to be excommunicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's not it really does. important. It, it's not really a good saying for pretty anything. Anything. No. Yeah. Because you're saying it as like nobody means it like a teacher. Well, that's what you signed up for being a teacher. Like you're never saying it. Uh, yeah, that's what you're doing type of way. You're always saying it as like a snarky, just deal with it. Yeah, it's way. it's condescending. Yeah, yeah. it's very it condescending. Yeah. Yeah. It's very dis- diminishing, right? It diminishes yes. the yes. person or the people who, who live that life. So yeah, absolutely. I do know that there, it wasn't there like an increase though in nursing schools because people did truly want to help is what I heard on the radio one day. Who knows if that's true? I don't, yeah. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> not too sure about that. It was at the very beginning of COVID that they saw more like an uptick, at least here in America. They saw an mm. uptick at, at some of the universities of people studying nursing because of the pandemic. Interesting. But basically just people wanting to help. Is yes. that, was that the, the thought? Yeah, basically. Probably basically the same type of thing after 9-11 happened. There was a, an increase in people that signed up to join the military. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's why well, that's always good to me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> gives you a little bit of hope of humanity, right? Like, yeah, it, <laughs> there are it shows you some people care. Yeah. That's yeah, right. absolutely. absolutely. This girl that I, I babysat when she was like much younger, which makes me feel really old. That's neither <laughs> here nor there. I'm not even that old. Like she got her nursing degree, like just at the start of COVID. And I'm like, oh my God, like your feet are to the fire and you just got out. You had like, like you guys said, you don't have any intentions of like going through a pandemic, like yeah. right after nursing school. I should, I need to yeah. message her and be like, so how did it go? <laughs> are you still nursing? <laughs> are, you, are you okay? <laughs> did you survive? I mean, actually, I That's know she it. survived, but still. Oh, 
Yeah. I mean, but that so, does happen. I mean, even yeah. think about the nurses during World War II when Pearl Harbor got hit. They weren't expecting to get bombed and have to deal with trauma injuries like yeah, that. Like, right. it's crazy. Nobody I mean, stuff like that happens. Any of that. Nobody no. knows expected 9-11 you never expect any of those no. major incidences to happen no. nobody's like on this day it's gonna happen <laughs> well it's so funny because well I shouldn't say it's funny it's, it's interesting because I was also around when SARS hit and I remember I was nursing I was actually frontline nursing in Vancouver Canada at the time and thinking okay SARS is hitting I'm in Vancouver and Vancouver is a huge port for a lot of traffic that comes from Japan and China and stuff. And I thought, we're going to get hit. That's it. Like, so we were all like, we're all prepared. Like we were ready. Nothing. My, again, my girlfriends in Toronto, SARS just went amok in Toronto. So it was to- two totally different perspectives. Um, but, you know, I think the one thing that I, I kind of know about, about nursing and healthcare, I'd like to say, is that you're, you're always constantly ready for anything like you, because on a daily basis, you never know what's walking through the door. You never know yeah. who you're going to get. You know what I mean? So you're always in that heightened state. You're just not in that heightened state for such a prolonged period of time. Right. So yeah. if you think you're, you're living up here constantly 24 seven for the last two years, like people are tired <laughs> people. And like, you know, if you think about the general population being tired of, of, the isolation and the masking and the restrictions, you know, you think about your first responders and how tired they are, right, as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we talked to um, a firefighter paramedic and he was talking about how, like, they would go to a fire and they wanted him to wear a mask and he's like, it's going to get all wet. Like, I'm spraying water. Like, that just doesn't work. Like, this doesn't, (laughs) this doesn't go together. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's nice your intentions, but sometimes- It doesn't work. It just yeah. doesn't work out. The only thing I was before was that I already worked f- from home. I was like, great. I'm already isolated. <laughs> I, I, I was like, haha, you guys are all figuring it out now that you have to work from home and doing this. <laughs> uh, well, that's funny. Yeah. Well, yeah, you don't have to worry about anybody else except your dog, and you ain't giving your dog COVID. <laughs> Well, yeah. And it's like, the only thing I'm doing is going out and getting groceries. Cause I'm probably the one person in the world who refuses to use Instacart. <laughs> I mean, you can, and you, plus you have to get out of the house every once in a while. You can't just live in your house. I mean, unless you don't I like, I just going don't outside, trust but. people. So, cause like I was watching videos of like people who are like, I ordered a cucumber. I got a zucchini or vice versa. I'm like, <laughs> I don't trust you people. I'm just going to go in on my own. And then like, and then I saw like my mother-in-law would use it or whatever. And she would order like half of these things and then some things they wouldn't have. So they would replace it with just whatever. And it sometimes I don't want an item replaced. If you don't have the specific item, I would just rather not have the item. And I just want to go to the grocery store. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> just let me do my one thing. We have one more. Um, so what do you like reading and writing about? You know, I honestly read from all different genres. I know it sounds bizarre. A, it depends on my mood. So right now I'm into like total spiritual self-help kind of Gabby Bernstein is like my guru at the moment. Yep. Um, I love her. Um, but I, I do read a lot of, a lot of, a lot. The last novel that I read though was um The Hangman's Daughter and it was a historical fiction and that's the that's the one those are the wrong that was the one genre that I hadn't read because I was like "Mm, historical fiction mm, it's gonna be boring and somebody gave me this book I did a postcard literary swap where you like you recommend a book and you send a postcard and they recommend a book yeah 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 Um, that's fun and it was a lot of fun anyways so they recommended this book and it was legit the best book I've the be- I shouldn't say the best book, the best historical fiction, because I've never read historical fiction, but it was really good because A, it had to do with um, a hangman, his daughter, and a witch. And I was like, boom. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> like, hello. Like, it's like You're the like- best. That's yeah. where I am right now, right? So, but I do read a lot of a lot of different things. I, I love YA, which is kind of embarrassing at my age. But I no, do it is no. I love no, no, YA, no. and I am. <laughs> I an love adult. young adults. You're definitely not the only one that reads like 
Oh, well, I read all sorts of different things. I'll do the same thing. I'll go from a spiritual book to a novel, to a self-help book, to a historical fiction. Like you're not the only one that bounces all over the place. <laughs> Yes. It's funny that you brought up historical fiction because I'm pretty sure this falls into historical fiction. I read um, The Tattooist of Auschwitz and that was oh, one of the like yes. first, his, I'm pretty sure that's historical fiction that I read. And I thought the same thing. I'm like, this is going to be really freaking sad. Why am I going to read this book? And it was so good. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So I am now a convert for historical fiction, 100%. All right. Um, Hangman's so, yeah. Daughter is going on my list right now. Yes. And there's, <laughs> I think there's like three, there's two other books in that series that I have to dive into, but I'm Ooh, reading okay. something else right now. So. I'm all about that. <laughs> Since yes. you like spiritual books, have you read um, John Kabat-Zinn? I have not, actually. Ooh, okay. I have not. I have not. Um, I think the last one that I wrote was uh, uh, Tin, Tin Niche. I'm going to say that wrong. <laughs> That's all right. I never yes. get stuff right either. <laughs> I know. Um, that was, the, that, uh, I think, of the same genre. I think the 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 best spiritual book and I read this years ago and I'd like to circle back to read it because I'm pretty sure I didn't understand it was the Celestine Prophecy I read that when I was like 18 19 now I think about some of the lessons in it because I've read The Alchemist since then and I think I need to go back and circle back to see what those lessons are you know that's that's the one book that I'd like to go back and circle back nice yeah I do that too Mm -hmm. Zinn wrote a book that was one of the first books I remember my dad ever giving to me about spirituality and it's called wherever you go there you are and um, I I think it's the same thing even though I was already in my 20s I don't think it quite hit me and so every like couple years or so I try to go back and reread it because it's it's the same thing like it's it just there's something about it and it'll connect better and it'll yeah and you'll connect better with it because it's well and when you're in different walks of life too it connects with you differently yeah Absolutely. And I think the messages come out stronger. Like right now I'm reading um, The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And I hadn't. Oh, that's a great read... book. Well, it's funny because I hadn't intended to read this book at all. Not at all. Eckhart Tolle hadn't... is wonderful. He is. But I like it's so funny how I came across this book. I was in a store and I was looking for a journal. No, I, that's a lie. I was looking for an agenda. And so I'm walking. And so this store is it's typically like a home store. It's almost like a trying to almost like a target but it doesn't mm-hmm. ha- it, it doesn't have books so it has like home items it has like bath items it has some like, like food a TJ items. Max. It, that's what that's probably like. yeah Maybe. or like a home goods which yeah. is kind of like a teammate tj max yeah we got you we're on yeah, your level oh, actually it is like a tj max because i think winners is the canadian version of tj max anyway gotcha. so i'm walking down this aisle and I'm like, oh, you know, this is the aisle where the agendas are, whatever. And I walk down and I find an agenda that I want and I pull it out and there's the power of now. And I was like, that's odd. This book never, ha- this store never has books, right? And so I stood there looking at it and I'm like, I think I need to buy this book, right? And of course I'm thinking, oh my God, if I buy another book, like if, I probably have about <laughs> seven books that I haven't read. And I thought, no, I have to buy it. So I ended up buying it um, and it sat on my shelf for a long time just because I hadn't circled around to it. And I'm actually in um, a 90 day sort of intensive with a bunch of women. And the books that we have to read are Eckhart Tolle. And the first book is The Power of Now. And I was like, see, I knew I had to buy this book. Right? Oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> oh. mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah, so. I was gonna say my dad actually bought me that book. It was kind of funny. He found yeah. it that, you know, libraries resell books and he bought it. He had told me forever to buy it or to read it he found it at the library for 50 cents and was like, look, I finally got you this. I was like, great, perfect. It was right before I moved to Hawaii, Connie. And he decided he wanted to reread it. I never got it. That's <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> it became well, his. Send you mine. <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll get my own. Thanks dad for nothing. <laughs> Thanks for nothing, dad. <laughs> it's not your time to read it. <laughs> no, nope, it wasn't as not. you know, it wasn't as perfect as finding yeah. a random book at a TJ Maxx because yes, you right? they, don't, they don't sell books. No. Okay, I'm gonna just go into TJ Maxx. One book. <laughs> so great. Yeah. I'm gonna go into TJ Maxx just looking for books from now on, just to see. <laughs> right. And then you'll and then you'll find like one each time, right? And then you'll have Good. to buy it too. I know like it'll be like the, it'll be like the shoes and the playing cards. I'll have to buy the book every time I go to your right. next. 
That's great. <laughs> Random things that you do. <laughs> oh my so, gosh. I love uh, it. So Kelly, is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners? Well, buy my book, Stories with Soul, out now. <laughs> How about that plug? Uh, oh, no, beautiful. But- I love that I your love- stories with soul has two meanings, like soul and then the soul of the shoe. Mm-hmm. I love that. I just, yeah, that, that in there. sorry. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It took me a while to come up with that actually. And I remember, cause I was testing it out on people. What do you think about this, this title? And somebody was like, seriously, that is just so kitschy. And I was like, perfect. I'm going with it. Like it's, <laughs> it's different. It's meant to be. But it, that's right. But it, it, you're right. It does have two meanings, right? The soul of a person and the soul of a shoe and tying it all together. So, But see, um, they wouldn't I necessarily like know that until they read the book. Or if you're listening to this podcast. Or if you're listening to the podcast. You're going to know <laughs> well, if you're yes, listening to the true. podcast. But still, beside <laughs> the point. Yes, exactly. But no, I think it's, a, it's, it's um, a very quick read. I think it'll take you on a journey of emotions for sure. But I and the stories are small enough that they're poignant, and I think you'll find I think I think there's something for everybody in in, in one of those stories. So awesome! Is it so on Amazon? I, it's on Amazon um, chapters in Canada because you know I I had to have like that's right put, <laughs> had to represent. But yeah, so chapters or um, Amazon for sure, and nice. yeah. Of course, put a link in the show notes so that everybody can not have to go oh. search for it. Perfect. Thank you. I will send you the link if you don't have it. (laughs) Yes, please. Just so I make sure that I have the right one or we have the right one. (laughs) And this is how to deal when shit gets real, guys. Thank you for joining us. And we will see you guys all next episode. And our episodes are now uh, being released every other Friday. Thank you for joining us. This is how to deal when shit gets real. We will be taking a break starting from this episode until August 3rd. And that is when we will post our first episode of season four. Have a great summer and see you guys then.